Okay. Well, thanks so much for joining me. I'm Ben Hauser, and thank you to the Cleveland Print Room for asking me to speak about my piece in the annual show. Uh, so this is a piece of mine uh, called Tears from the Lotus, an Egyptian Myth to Reflect the President. And this is my subversive take on that myth, which goes that on the first day in the waters of chaos, the lotus flower rose and blossomed above the surface. And there was an infant God within who wept and the world flowed forth from his tears. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment, but I want to give a little bit of background on the technique and some of the influences uh, behind this work. So what I'm doing here, th these are all darkroom materials. And so I'm taking color photographic paper, taking it out of the box, uh, turning on the room lights, and then spreading the chemistry over the paper. Uh, so there isn't a camera and there isn't a negative and it's not an image originally of something. That's a question that I get quite a bit. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the early influences on this work. It's a, it's a style that I've been doing for a number of years and alchemy was a subject that helped inform quite a bit of this. And I think rather than thinking of that as uh, thinking of those folks as just primitive chemists, uh, I think we can think of them as after something a little more poetic and a little more mystical. And they were using very elaborate metaphors in their writings. Uh, a phoenix is a great example. Of course, a bird that rose from its own ashes. And if you're working in a dark room in this way, you know, if you take a piece of paper out and turn on the lights, you've just ruined that paper per any traditional standards. But that is then exactly what makes this process possible. It's exactly that, that inversion, that transformation of technique. And something else that's been an influence, someone else, is Carl Jung who is a Swiss psychologist, and he studied things like alchemy and dreams, and he was uh, very interested in seeing where the conscious and unconscious minds met. Uh, to him, what would happen there is what he called the transcendent function, where something would sort of occur that would lead somebody's psyche forward to some sort of higher self. And I think that's an interesting way to imagine using a darkroom in this sense, where you're taking a piece of paper from nothing and transforming it into something. Uh, and so Jung was very interested in studying the psyche on an individual level with patients and on a much more collective or cultural level. He um, worked quite a bit with mythology. He studied that extensively. So if we return to our original myth, when Trump got elected, uh, you know, I was, I was distraught, as I'm sure many of us were. And I was sort of wondering, you know, how do you speak about this as an artist? You know, he, he's just such an infant and he'll never own up to a mistake. He'll never apologize. He just throws these temper tantrums. Uh, uh, and then I, I sort of realized at one point, well, you know, that's exactly the subject. And so this myth of this lotus flower was actually something that I had um, worked with before several years ago uh, for a different reason, though within this process, but for a different reason. And so that sort of shot back to me all of a sudden. And I said, well, I could use that narrative in a, in a subversive way and then speak to exactly the sorts of things I want to uh, speak to. You know, I mean, it, it just sort of boggles my mind that didn't we kind of figure out from ancient Egyptian times forward that you sort of shouldn't have a child ruling your kingdom? you know, let alone a, uh, a very stable genius, godlike child. I mean, just gotta, 
kind of raise my hand in the back and see if uh, we've kind of confirmed that through history. Uh, but then another way that we could think about this a little bit is, you know, a lotus flower is such a symbol of, of perfection and wholeness that maybe it's, you know, really us in our attempt to make a more perfect union and seeing that frustrated and seeing the, the you know, the, the, the tragedy of our current American moment. Because tears, of course, can represent really the complete range of human emotions, laughter to frustration, to anger, to, to you know, you name it, gain, loss. Um, so something else that's been an influence on this, a musical influence on a certain sense of tension is my favorite band, Led Zeppelin. And I think there's something in their work that, that is just, you know, simply magical, number one. Uh, and number two, there's a certain just kind of explosive, aggressive sense of beauty in a lot of their songs. And that's something that I've tried to translate into a, a visual aesthetic. And I think within this, we have lots of moments of is something blowing apart or is something recoalescing in some way. And I think they as a band, although they were not making protest songs, strictly speaking, they were nonetheless around at a time of, of real cultural unrest and real generational unrest. Uh, and I think we very much find ourselves in that kind of moment today. And No Quarter Live is very much the anthem of the darkroom and of this process. Uh, a very dark magic to it, but also very poetic. And those opening keyboards that just sound, you know, very much submerged reminds me so much of uh, slipping the paper into the tray under the water and kicking off this magical occurrence. Uh, so speaking of water, um, I suppose a final thing that I'll mention that has started to inform this more and more uh, is that I've always known certain bits of Eastern thought or certain bits of Taoism, but I've started to pursue that a little more and a little more seriously. And when I would, in times past, when I would describe uh, the, the, the actual moment of making these pieces, what that, what that really felt like, I would sort of say, it's, you know, it's like an improvisation, which is not false, it's not, it's not a false way of describing it, but something about that never really fully captured the idea. And in Taoist thought, they have this sense of emptiness, or what they call no mind, which is not the same as mindless, uh, but it is, it, it's, it's sort of a very heightened, but a very relaxed state of mind at the same time, kind of very free and very full all at once and when you kick off this reaction when, when you start a piece like this there is suddenly a whole lot of things happening on the paper all at once so to make some sort of uh, harmonious or graceful uh, composition that doesn't look like simply a mess really requires i think that kind of state of mind um, uh, otherwise, you, you're just going to end up with something not so appealing. And that also requires years of practice. And I've been doing this for about eight or nine years in this technique, starting out with very traditional darkroom uh, imagery. And this has been my path, my journey through photography. Um, and so that is more or less what I have to say about the piece here. Uh, I suppose I will close with, with a final thought, which is all of these things, you know, I, I kind of hate to use the word psychedelic because the work has nothing to do with any sort of drug culture. But the, the true roots, the true meaning of that word are to make the soul or the mind visible. Uh, uh, and I think one of the real goals of an artist is to 
articulate something in their medium. I think that's one of, one of the, the real benefits of art is that it helps sort of share ourselves with ourselves. So I will leave you with that. And thanks for coming along.